Bob did the next section, but I've asked for a group effort and uh, a little bit about what it's about. And, and I'll interject, I'll probably interject more than Bob wants me to in the next section, but it's okay. Uh, we'll figure it out. I do that a lot. The, this is a repeat. And it's a repeat from, four, or from two or three years ago. I don't remember when we last did it. It's two or three years ago. It's lessons learned, basically, from installing analyzers in the system. Uh, and uh, I didn't ask if anybody had questions on the PLCs, not sure you would. But when we go out and do analyzer replacements, and we do a lot of them. And when we do PLC replacements, and we do a lot of those, uh, and software upgrades and, and SEMS replacements or SEMS upgrades, what are all the things that we need to consider? What are the things that we have trouble with? Uh, what happens when you replace a heated sample line? That sounds easy. <laughs> Not always as easy as it needs or should be. Uh, people have gone more to, we used to use only lines that had to be to turn the link could not be changed or altered more than a slight amount. And a lot of our customers want to be able to cut off 100 feet. You're wasting money, by the way. I'm going to tell you, they're 50, 60, 70 dollars on foot. So you're not, you cut off 100 feet of line. And it's, we had one site down in Texas that ordered 190 extra feet. 190 extra feet of heat sample line on one unit. Uh, don't understand that. But uh, so we, we can trim the lines to a certain extent, but we can't just hack them on. But what are the what are the things you have to think about? What are the things you have to talk about? Do you need an engineer to come out to the site? Do you need someone to visit before we do all the work? Uh, what's necessary? What isn't necessary? What can you do yourself? So all of those things are things that we've learned over the course of time as we become. Uh, well, we used to just do some systems. And we'd build a shelter or a cabinet, we'd send it out, and that's all we did. And then I found out that Len designed some systems too well, and we built them too well because they never they never got old. They just kept working, but some of the components broke, and so we'd have to go out and replace the components. Well, the old components weren't available, so we'd have to put new components. So our business model has really shifted. Probably 50% of our work today is replacing old stuff in existing shelters. And that's a whole new business model that you hadn't anticipated 10 or 15 years ago. And so it's uh, now what we do a lot. And as we do that, we learn more and more every time we go out in the field to do that. And so this next topic is kind of an open discussion. And I have a lot of people here uh, from a lot of different areas. Wes is here as the head of the field service group. But we also have Robert back there. Robert, raise your hand. I don't think anybody mentioned it earlier. Uh, Robert's one of our field service techs. We have David, who's our operations manager, whose guys have to build all the stuff that goes out in the field. Uh, that's here. Cindy Lease is back there, who's head of our PLC group. She has a fancy title, but basically she's head of our PLC group. Uh, and they do an incredible amount of PLC replacements and software upgrades and software replacements and uh, on other people's hardware and what that looks like. And, uh, and then Bob's going to do the talking up here in a minute uh, about and he's the head of our engineering group. Uh, and then Len's here with all of his experience. Reggie's here from a regulatory standpoint. I'm here because I put my finger on everything uh, and deal with the pricing on stuff and West does too. And so we're, we're all kind of going to share ideas as some things come up. We'll interject, ask questions because you might have some situations where you say, Do I really want that water bath or should I switch to a thermal electric? I really want that thermal electric cooler, or should I get one of your really great water baths? I hope that was obvious. Like I said. Uh, so whatever whatever that happens to be, we, we look at all those different things. So uh, Bob, you can take it from here. And see what goes. Wait. Okay, so like Paul said, uh, we're doing a lot of these upgrades, um, especially in the springtime and in the fall. Although this fall is not quite as busy as past falls, but um, everybody here knows that's when the outages are. 
and that's when they want the work done. So it can be a, a huge rush uh, at those times of the year. Um, we just went through a pretty busy spring. Um, lots of analyzers uh, being changed out, PLCs being changed out, um, some sample system stuff. Um, so when it's time to upgrade any of your equipment, a couple of questions you have to ask, uh, you know, how complicated is the project? Do you need an engineer or one of the proposal engineers to go to the site to evaluate the equipment that you have and make recommendations? Um, that's a good way to go. Uh, I'd say that we're only doing site visits 10% of the time. Um, so it's not common that we, we visit sites, but it's certainly uh, advisable, uh, especially if it's a complicated type of uh, replacement project. Um, and then every time there's a replacement, you have to consider, as Walt mentioned, that the new equipment may not be compatible with what you had before. So um, what might seem like a straightforward replacement gets more and more complicated as you start to dig deeper. Uh, and certainly, you know, Wes and uh, engineer who will identify those things and try to get them, you know, um, up front uh, during the proposal stages as best we can. Um, one of the things that we run into on these projects is, especially when it's somebody else's sense, is are the drawings accurate? How, how do we get our information? Um, you know, that picture helps a lot. We always ask for pictures photos of all the equipment that you have, but uh, you know, the drawings are critical and it's so often that we don't get drawings. Um, and we're working blind a lot of times, so uh, keeping a uh, good tabs of your drawings would be very helpful. Um, it's obvious, but uh, it's not always the case. Some of these systems are very old and the drawings have either disappeared or they're just no longer accurate because things have changed so much over the years and they were not updated. So we do the best that we can to keep up on the drawings. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, you're totally encouraged to do is to make sure we get to those updated drawings when we're done with the job. That's, that's our responsibility, but uh, it definitely helps. Um, you know, and sometimes something might change, like there's a new alarm that comes with a new piece of equipment that you have, the old piece of equipment didn't have a fault alarm, the new one does, so now you need a software upgrade where you probably weren't anticipating it. So, uh, little things come up in these questions. A um, couple other things, you know, to find the installation, um, you know, we get an idea of what needs to happen before we go to a site. Uh, we have to communicate that to you guys as best we can so that you're, we're all on the same page. Um, sometimes we might need additional support. Um, for instance, CCF lines, we don't, we don't install those. You have to get a contractor to do that. So um, understanding your role to get that contract and get that uh, figured out before we get to the site and then I'm going to make sure they are installed before we get to the site, is important. Um, one of the things, though, that always becomes an issue with the downtime, uh, not always, but quite frequently, downtime is a problem. Um, we get to the site, and we're ready to do the work, and we, we're told we can't work, our field guy. And because there is a, you know, a spike in the power demand, and you got to start running the dirt, much you can do about it, um, except to give you an idea beforehand that you know, we need to know, but you, we need to uh, coordinate as best we can the downtime so that we are able to do the work when we get to the site and uh, we're, we're there at the right time. Um, and build, build on the that's another thing. Um, but I'm just curious about things like the incentive line survey. Or just fly on that these days too? Is that like everything else? I mean, um, get it we've been getting mostly uh, lines with tech heaters and thermal on. Uh, Orion, um, occasionally. 
I'd say Tech Heaters is still on their standard schedule about five weeks, and Vermont slipped for a while. Um, they say they're getting back, uh, not quite seen it yet, but uh, some lines come in. But I, I would give Vermont eight weeks, unfortunately, right now. Um, you know, they, they say they're hiring more people. The thing with them is it's not the supply thing as much, although they have had some supply issues. Um, for them, it's manpower. They just um, have ramped up in their business and uh, haven't been able to keep up. They keep saying they're hiring more people. It's going to turn around, so we'll see. Um, no safety requirements. It's, for any kind of work, we're going to a site. We have to make sure we understand what the requirements are, so our guys are ready and can get um, immediately to work, or mostly as quickly as possible, considering what kind of requirements there are. Um, safety training, that sort of thing. So all this should get worked out before we get to the site. Um, sometimes. You know, it's, it's, it's a kind of burden for us to carry a whole bunch of extra tools when you guys have a lot of tools at the site. So sometimes we'll actually ask you, can we borrow a drill? You know, beforehand. If it's a problem, we'll bring a drill. It's not a big deal. But uh, it's just that's something you have to pack and ship and ship back and all that stuff. So occasionally you might ask for some tools. Um, not that we don't want to be prepared, but it makes make more sense to work out. Uh, other things that happen uh, during equipment upgrades is the environmental side of it. Um, because you change the analyzer, there's some requirements that you have to meet uh, by the EPA. And it might be a new RATA certification, um, calibration, CPAs, audits. Uh, we have a little chart at the end, and uh, Chris can help confirm it's on here. Um, that's another consideration, and you know that's usually additional work that uh, Cisco does in most of these projects. So uh, it's going to be talked about up front, and there's going to be a cost associated with making sure the monitoring plan and the QAQC plan get updated. If it's somebody else's QAQC document, we like to get a copy of it so that uh, you know, the plan made it themselves. We get a copy so that we can understand where you're at with that and help uh, update it as well so we can work with other people's documents. Usually what we'll do is we'll transfer all the data to our document and that way one of our standing documents will contain the data that we had previously. Um, so the other thing about that is being prepared for the certification requirements because if you have to do a RATA, uh, you have to have RATA to do so it has to happen up front. You have to understand that uh, that part has to be coordinated in the timeline. Um, so as far as other documents go, a lot of times IO lists are updated, uh, DOG specifications are updated. The DOG specification, if you're not familiar, is the DOG computer uh, specification, which says what the limits are, um, what, like, what parameters are in the system, Signals are being um, utilized to make calculations, what the calculations are. Um, so it's really for our software group so that they can program the software, but it's also for you to understand what's in the software. So that's an important document that should get updated. Uh, I think it's relevant to what's being done. Do uh, drawings be supplied? Uh, you know, drawings are always required. Uh, if there's other, if it's just, with non Cisco system, we're limited in how much drawing updates we can do. We just give you what we've done, you know, as far as the changes go, and we'll reference your, your other drawings. So if it's a uh, KBB system, we will reference the KBB drawings, but uh, we'll, we'll make new drawings for what the portion of the work that we are responsible for. Uh, Ona and manual updates, uh, those certainly go along with drawing updates and other documents. Uh, it's basically a compilation of all the documents for your system. Uh, that's not always an option that's taken on some of these updated projects because um, they're not always so complicated that they're required. But um, we like to try to get those manuals updated as well. Um, 
sometimes uh, analyzer ranges are they the same? The reason why that's up there is because sometimes uh, the customer will say we will need to change out our analyzers. Okay, so here's your new CO analyzer, and um, when you replace an analyzer, it just seems like it's a good time to upgrade your ranges while you're at it. Um, a lot of times, the old ranges ranges don't capture all of your startup emissions. Um, old ranges might be zero to ten and zero to two hundred, and you, you well know that uh, if you're a startup, you're way above two hundred ppm. So want to capture all your emissions, which most agencies are requiring you to do now, you um, want to bump up that secondary range. May as well do it now or upgrade the analyzer. Of course, what that means, you need new cow gases. Um, generally on these upgrades, we don't provide those cow gases um, because your existing site, you already have your vendors, you're already buying cow gas, so Another thing that has to be coordinated is you have to have your cow gases ready for when we get on site to install the new analyzer. That's what you want to do in the testing. You know, then uh, some of the work that we do may uh, res result in working with equipment that might be obsolete. And you no know, IT panelists, classic example, PLCs, um, all the things that Walt was talking about. Uh, if we can't update your OIP because it's outdated, then you're going to be limited on, on how much functionality you have as you use the upgrade. So, okay, look at those things. Um, you know, we have to find how many people we have going to the site, um, what assistance to provide the plans. You know, we have to get on the staff, are we allowed to just climb up there? Do we have to company if that sort of thing. Um, and if we send one person out for an analyzer upgrade, it's nice to have a plan. Uh, and you know, let's drop analyzers uh, if you have two hands on, on an analyzer for an installation. So we might have to do some, some help on that. Uh, so what could the equipment be shipped prior to installation phase? Oh, when did the uh, ship? Um, you know, that's you try to ship things as soon as possible, so uh, you just have to be there in time to be relevant to when you're ready to install it. And if you have to install things before but we get there, like a new probe, you need a couple of weeks to do that. So you can plan that out. Uh, maintenance of equipment is essential. Okay, this is a big one. Um, sometimes when our field guys get to the site to do, say, an analyzer upgrade, um, they find that they're spending half of their first day or two days working on problems completely unrelated to the analyst because there's a leak in the system, there's a um, water in the system filled up, there's all kinds of other issues that will make it very difficult for us to prove that our analyzer is working for us. Uh, new analyzer. So um, we can't, we don't want to put a new analyzer in and have water in the analyzer. So, end up spending extra time uh, doing things that were really out of, out of scope. So this is a, a you know, big one, how do we deal with it? You know, we usually just have to deal with it and fix the system up the best we can and get the job done. It means extra hours and you know, we're going to try to go back and charge you for those extra hours if it was, if it was uh, happening. So just another thing to be aware of, make sure your system is in good shape before the upgrade. Okay, so here's sample lines. Uh, everyone wants to know the lifespan of their sample line. And it's a really difficult one because uh, it's really all, all over the place. We know that there's plenty of lines that have been for operating for 20 years. And it's amazing, they still work. And just don't touch it, you know, don't run it too far, don't even turn it on and off. Something might happen. But uh, they, they work. Um, others have failed really quickly after just a few years. Uh, it's hard to say exactly why um, there's such a big diversity. Um, I think it's just the quality of the field of the sample line. I think that's what it comes down to. So um, what we do is we kind of take the average here and say that a sample line should last for about 10 years. So that's a 
to look up. Uh, so, not, another couple of things on sample lines. Now, we have used technical gears as our main supplier of sample lines for years and years, for a long, long time. Um, they've been a great line, and some of those lines are the ones that have been in service for 20 years. Uh, however, there was a period where they started to lose their quality control, and there's a, they have immediate, immediate failures. And so we started looking at other lines, and we learned that uh, the other lines have their advantages, and they, they work very well. We're not seeing a lot of disadvantage from them. So uh, we are now recommending um, other suppliers, Fairmont and Amitech, over there. So if you call up and you say you want to sample line, we're going to go with Fairmont, most likely. So, it's just a more robust line. It, it just it just looks stronger. It is stronger. The, the jacket is um, more robust. It's just a better quality line, um, in our opinion. Uh, and the other big advantage of the course is that it's trimmable. So for you guys, that may not be such an issue. As a matter of fact, kind of from the opposite direction. Because if you're replacing a line, you're not concerned with getting a line that's too long. Because you know the line is going to get the same line in half. Um, most of the time, that should be the problem. But uh, for new systems, when the length, the length's not known, you know, that either becomes a better, I mean, the uh, becomes a better option because you can cut the length. So you can order an extra 50 feet, pay for it, and then uh, cut, it, cut it to the length so it fits your well. And customers really like that. They don't like to have excess line, you know, uh, exactly back and forth. So that's the uh, big, big advantage of the thermos. The disadvantages, you know, I don't want to get too far into it, um, but the disadvantages are, you know, that uh, with, with the parallel construction line, you have parts of it that aren't working, you'll never know it, or it's really hard to tell, and you have full spots, but um, we haven't seen that as being a significant problem, at least hasn't uh, proven itself. Um, so, like I said, we'll, we'll recommend these ultimate suppliers, Zermont, Amitech, others. Uh, basically, it's a group that we call parallel construction lines because you come to length, you know, they're 20 foot, 24 inch lines instead of one big, you know, 120 foot line, 200 foot line. Um, a series of a straight of parallel construction. Um, So uh, the two big things you want to consider if you're considering changing lines is if you've got tech heaters, you want to replace it, you can put a new tech heaters line in there and it's going to be a very easy job to replace it because it's going to be the right length, all the connections are going to be the same, the power requirements are the same, the diameter is the same, and it's just going to fit in because it's going to be connected a couple of tubes, you get your power connection and you're done. But if you want to switch from a tech heaters line to a thermon line, you got to work a little hard. Okay, because the thermon line has a much bigger diameter. It's actually a less efficient line, and so they need more insulation in order to get the heat. Um, but by doing that now, you've got to deal with the fact that it doesn't fit in the hole that you have in your, your, your bulkhead, it doesn't fit in the hole of the probe. So you have to fill bigger holes. You have to change up to a you know, larger. Uh, Heat shrink booth, that sort of thing. The other thing with these lines is they don't come pre terminated. So you have to terminate them. So you have to have someone qualified, you know, medium qualified electrician to make those electrical connections and seal the line to make sure the water gets in and that kind of thing. So it's more installation work. Usually we do the work. So if we're going to install at least a portion of it, we won't install the line in the stack, but you know, almost all of these projects we're going out to actually look at the line uh, termination. Not always, but we can do that work. Uh, our guys do it all the time. Uh, we do still recommend the sample line control. 
if you're going to do it, a decent line upgrade. Um, controlling that line to a known temperature is highly recommended. You're just going to save the heater, uh, and you're going to have peace of mind knowing you know what the temperature is. Because um, with lines that aren't temperature controlled, they, they operate on a principle of minimum temperature. So if your minimum temperature is, say, 350 degrees for a pneumonia style, you know, a, a line that's has ammonia presence, you have to keep the temperature up to 350, you put any ammonia salts to form it. So at 350, that's the minimum temperature. So that means it's always hotter than 350. So it could be 400, it could be 420. Hope it's not 450, because I think that we'd see some damage at that point, but um, they, they, they tend to run hot. So controlling the line to your known temperature is just a, a better way to go. Um, we have in the past uh, recommended using an alternate uh, uh, online offline set nice on, on, on the temperature of the sample line so that when the turbine is online, you want it to be full of the temperature of 350 degrees Fahrenheit. But when it's offline, we recommend to bring that temperature down to say 150 to save the heater. And the reasoning behind that is that the um, that, that heater, if, it's, if the process is off, that heater has to work very hard because it's pulling in air in the wintertime. It could be zero degree, 20 degree air, just trying to heat it up to 350 degrees. So you're, you're basically maxing out, maxing out that, uh, that heater. Um, however, we found that there's been a lot of times that we've had problems with this method of, of going offline and turning on that temperature. Um, the time it takes for the, for the sample line to change temperatures uh, has resulted in some moisture contaminating the sample line, contaminating the sample, um, causing delays in the response to the analyzers. So uh, there's also been issues where um, the signals are telling us that the turbine is offline, but it's not. You know, there's still moisture in the process that's getting into the sample line. So, um, after all, much ado, we, we decided that we're, we're not going to do that anymore. It's going to keep the temperature steady on the sample line. So that's sample line. We got a lot of topics here, um, and I don't want people to forget about them you know, at, at the end. So if I have questions on sample lines. So you mentioned uh, zigzag. Now, ours are all zigzag now from day one. Yes. Is there a reason for that, or can I run it straight down? Run it straight down. The reason why, the reason why is because uh, the engineer guessed that it was going to be 150 foot line. When uh, so someone someone had a model, they said it's going to be 120 feet, and the engineer said, okay, well, I don't want to order it too short, so I'm going to make it 140 feet. And he got the first conversion, 140 feet, and they said, well, I don't want to make it too short, so they added. Next thing you know, we got the hundred foot line, and they get to the, to the to the site, and they can't do anything. They can't cut that line because it's that huge line. So they have, instead of cutting it, they have to zigzag back and forth. So I didn't know if it, it was to support the weight or no. I mean, I have to see your installation to say for sure. I just, from my understanding, anytime you do zigzag, it's because the line is too long. The line only needs to be supported every 25 feet on a vertical support. Um, so, and, and it's almost always installed the cable tray. But you got that same situation for the control of the thermal You can't just drop it down and cut it here. Yeah, you can't fix that one. No, no I'm not. <laughs> but I'm intending. My decent one that was 17 years old, I was planning on doing an analyzer and heat sample line change. So if I'm going to change and do the sample line, why go back to the 140 foot line when I could? Yeah, you're going to save a lot of money. I mean, uh, that, you know, if it's an extra 40 feet that you're saving, you'll be trying to 60, 20, 20 bucks. Um, no pay. <laughs> so, oh, isn't one end already terminated though? Yeah, so that's sealed off. You just have to terminate the one end. I'm oh, sorry, say it again. Isn't the one end already terminated? And then you just have to Yes, that's how we work. The, the top end is, is, is factory terminated, and we just have to terminate the bottom. 
Now, if it gets installed correctly, then that's great. But a lot of times, someone did the installer of the line, the contractor, like, oh, you zip the line, puts it up, and it's three feet above the pro. So it makes it great to have an expert. So now you can either move that line and zigzag it, or you can, unless you want to do the whole line over again, or you just cut that three feet off. So you might be turning it. Oh, yeah, I'm just saying you still do have to be careful at the bottom end because the thermocouple only goes a certain distance up. That's true. Yeah. But that's so, only if you really overestimate the length of the line. We have had trouble where we totally cut the thermocouple out of the sample line. That's never good. Yeah. That's happened. You know, to cover that, you know, we, we put the thermocouple 50% up the line, and okay, now it's. <laughs> should be impossible. <laughs> and they still cut it off. <clears throat> it's happened. When y'all replaced our heated sample lines, one of the points y'all made a, a big deal about was not using zip ties attaching them. Zip ties are okay. Uh, no, we're going to figure these part of it. What we don't like is the little zip, zip ties that you, you typically see there, just a quarter of an inch. But then you got a lot more you know, pounds. Yeah, yeah. Quarter of a square inch. So if you get the half inch ones, they work pretty well. Okay. Um, you know, the, the other option is to use uh, you know, calendar grips for vertical support. That they're highly interested. And the other thing is, uh, I see a lot of metal clamps. Metal clamps tend to be tight. You know, I, I think they work, but I say that I like the clamp better because it doesn't look like they, they have to tighten it down as much. You see any problem with tie wraps? No, I think the plastic is okay. You'll probably break the tie wrap before you cinch it down too tight, but if you use metal, you can potentially damage the internal of the sample. Yeah, I, was on, I just remember it being a point issue I wanted to bring up. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're difficult, though, it's the find out what length line you need. You've got to cut all that zigzag, and you need an accurate length because you can't just go off. Any other simple line questions? You'll see here. Is there an updated heat of the line controller that you recommend, or are you still just using the dead heat? Yeah, we, we use a lot of those controller, typically. Um, we do some control with the uh, PLC as well. We like we like the walk load because it's we think it's more I think it's more robust in my personal opinion. Um, it's, uh, the contacts on PLC would definitely fail after some time. We can have some problems with the digital with the solid state and all that on PLCs. Yes. Uh, so on our real view, so we have to capture the online offline pieces of that we could have capture one. Uh, you, you can do that. The other thing you can do is, is to lower it so it's still up, the, the offline temperature, so it's still above the acid three point. So if you've got 350 for your, for your stack, uh, for your online, you can make it 250 or 220 for your offline. Uh, to be safe. Now, I mean, and then again, if you're not having any problems, your signals are working, and uh, it, what we think is it has a lot to do with response time of the sample line. So if you've got a tech heaters line, I don't know if that's what you have, but um, you know, I don't know. Okay. The tech okay, the way tech heaters works is they have a, a heater wire that is actually um, wrapped around the tube that is the sample tube. So the heat transfers the meat. Whereas with these other lines, it's a separate cable. And um, Cable is good because it provides so much more protection rather than that exposed wire. But it takes a lot longer to put the heat to, to, to you know, put a sample temperature to get up to the set point because of that separation. Okay. PLC OIT replacement. Um, Okay, we talked about how uh, GE doesn't do that anymore. Uh, it's now Emerson, uh, the RX3i, um, Alan Bradley Slicks, it's kind of repeated stuff. 
actually, you know, uh, some components really are obsolete already with the slits. So it's not just a matter of high cost. Some of them are going to be some Some components will not be. You know, uh, we recommend uh, for PLC replacements, the contact and control logics. Control logics are very expensive version. Don't really see the need for it because we don't see failures with, with the compact logics. Really, the only need is to do a redundant requirement. Um, also mentioned. Um, again, automation direct is, is a, more most often, uh, the panel we use most often. Uh, Alan Bradley is still fairly popular. Get away from Maples, you know that. Um, so, this is all kind of repeated from, from that. Yes, Cindy. I I frequented about the project to the about the geologic numbers. I just want to say Okay. Occasionally, it's just Okay. Yeah. Yeah, class one did too. We, we, we do class one did two um, projects. I don't know, 10% of the time, 50% of the time. So it's not always the top of my mind, but that's, that's a good point. Um, that's what we did to it, bringing a whole other you know, aspects of equipment and whatnot. So uh, we haven't addressed that at all here. Uh, mostly we're talking about uh, the general purpose stuff. So again, this is uh, covered by a wall. Uh, data loggers. We do replace data loggers. Uh, on occasion, uh, there was a time when we didn't quite frequently. Now it's kind of calmed calm down a little bit, but the you know, data logger um, uses corporate policy that motivates that change and uh, runs it over Cisco. Uh, so we'll go up. We've got a good method of changing out uh, a data logger because we don't have to do any of their wiring. We use their connectors, connect it up to a set of connectors that we make. With pre wired PLC, so it's really pretty simple turnover. Okay, serial communication with DCS. This is always a problem when it arises. A lot of DCSs are old and uh, they don't necessarily talk to Ethernet, and if they do, it's a very costly upgrade. So, most customers, and if they, even if they do talk to Ethernet, can get it in one paper, you still have to program it into the DCS. So that becomes a big expense. So a lot of these sites where once upon a time everything was serial, they want to keep it serial. Um, problem with that is it's outdated technology to some degree. And um, the DCS, now if you're using Alan Bradley, Alan Bradley is very finicky about talking serial to the serial. We're trying to match protocols with a DCS um, and like say that oh, it don't talk to the H really doesn't want to do it. Um, we've got plenty of sites where we struggle with uh, serial communications. And usually the result, and Cindy can help me out, is that the DCS has to be upgraded. A new card has to be put into the PLC and the DCS. We've been able to fix it a couple of times with changing our equipment out. And we think we've got a good serial card now. That's a great idea. So we get the equipment together, we go out there before the installation, before the downtime issue comes up, and you know, limited downtime that we have to work on it, try to test it to make it work. So something to keep in mind. So you know, we try to come up with our solutions. Uh, you know, we've gone through this several times, so maybe it's not as big an issue, but it has been an issue in the past. So it's something to consider here that DCS communications can be a stumbling block. Sometimes aren't the communications between the 
existing PLC and our gas serial as well. We have to have them lay fiber or something of that sort. Um, Plant network is not up to date, basically. I don't know if we've got serial communications. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, we have the PA, we have the older modules. Is that paper paper problem? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, I've stuck cards. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but that's easy, but that's easy to change over the internet. I don't know if we've ever been really caught on that. Yeah, but if they don't have the infrastructure already, you know, yeah, yeah. Right. good point. Okay, gotcha. I suppose you could put in a first office or a computer. Yeah. A lot of people have been changing uh, over to fiber anyway because you had the KF3 module and the other module that was on the slit that every time it's lightning strike, you would get <laughs> that module to fail. And make that module to happen on the slit all the time. Um, so it's a good idea to get that fire just for that reason. For all protocol converters in the garage. Okay, so so testing the system. Um, you know, we've really improved our in-house testing over the last several years. It's been Still going, but we've gotten better and better. Um, we've got just a more regimented uh, procedure for our testing. So this probably is not as big a deal as it may have been. Um, but when we do our testing, you know, we, we test all the I/O. We, we, we look at the software, make sure everything's working. We get to the site, and we find out that something's not. The customer's not happy with something on the software. The you know, report doesn't look right. Doesn't have the right data. Um, something might be wrong. So basically all we want to do is just to let you know that uh, you know, we're going to make sure the system is working, but there's going to be a time period where, where we rely on customers to review the software and make sure it's working the way they want it to. And um, you know, if there's any problems, we're going to fix those problems before you know, we consider the project complete. So uh, it does that. Uh, another thing that happened, um, you know, that we, we found the problems um, from, from past, past experiences is uh, our techs are taking longer to get the job done than we anticipated because downtime issues, uh, you know, service coming on to the software, stuff like that. Um, there was something happened at a site recently, a chemical spill, right? We couldn't work for a day and a half to make a field of product, right? Couldn't work for two days with the chemical stuff. So um, things happen. Uh, so, you know, our procedure is to just document what happens and uh, you know, deal with it later as far as financially paying for time for us. Okay, so uh, with regards to PLCs, sample lines, and analyzed replacements. This is, I think, a little down on your environmental requirements. So, um, you got part 60, you got part 75. Um, basically, part 60 is kind of quiet on this kind of thing because they never really got into it. Uh, you know, what, what happens when there's a problem, a breakdown, or a replacement of parts? Part 75 does. So, this is really part 75 rules. And, um, Reggie, did you mention that you're they're contacting all the states about this uh, part 75. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for a new analyzer, um, you have to do a data cal check. Oh, yeah. Uh, new analyzers must pass the data cal check, so you have to do that immediately. That starts the clock for your uh, for all the other requirements, which is 21 days for a seven drip test. I mean, Hours for the area checks and 720 hours operating hours for the rep. So. It was uh, 21 days and 21 unit operating days. Operating days as well. Okay, so um, 
So be prepared for all of that and understand the timeline there. Um, excuse me, most of the time that is out of our scope on these upgrade projects. We, we usually do the data and certification on new projects, but um, because you guys are already in the group of this kind of thing, you handle it yourselves and you know, that's fine. Um, so we just try to communicate this up front. Um, Form daily for schedule line, that's with daily cow check and abbreviated uh, response time check. And if you don't know what those are, um, it's pretty easy to look up or you can just give us a call and talk to you about it. Response time test is a little finicky, it did a couple of different I guess, variations of it, and whatnot, so we still get it one night. Then we're at 720 operating hours. For PLC, there's no testing required, you just have to update. Uh, so the, the one item on there that has uh, come up to be a little bit uh, controversial is a whole analyzer required to run linear and operate more than 68 hours in operating two net quarter for approximately time. So what that means is let's say you're going to do an upgrade in August. Okay, so here's what your second, your third quarter is <laughs> July to September. Is that right? Um, so you're right in the middle there. August. So you run your old analyzer for a month. Did you do a QA on those? Did you do your quarterly linear? Because you got to put a new analyzer in August. That new analyzer is going to get you tests, so it's all set. But what about all the data from the time that third quarter started up to the point you changed the analyzer? Is that data QA? We think it's not. That's our interpretation. Does the grace period not? Come into effect now? If you don't. Yeah, so, so basically, they could come into account for that when they take under that still grace period from the other The issue that came up was if, uh, if, in, if a, a linearity was done on the old analyzer in the Q2 quarter, or uh, or we done on the Q2, did you need to do a linear on that new analyzer? And that's what that data came in. And it's our stance that that new analyzer is an entity to itself and you need to go in here and run that as well. So there was some equivocation on the fact that how the EPA responded. Uh, and it does appear in the corresponds from Charles Prescott, it seemed like you wouldn't have to do that second one year, but ECMPS would go in as well and say the opposite. It's not hard test to do. Uh, I would say if you're on the safe side, do it, but it's not always, you know, if it, it turns out that you replace the analyzer and you didn't do it, um, uh, QA on your old analyzer before you replace it, it might get. By EMPS, or if you're not, there is. Sounds funny, but uh, just before you replace that old analyzer, it's a good idea to run a daily count. Yeah. Uh, because you, you want to make sure that that data is QA up to the point you replace it. Otherwise, you, you, it may only be 8 to 24 hours, but you may lose some data based on the QA requirements of that, too. So. We've learned the, the little nuances that don't seem like much add up after a while. And so, oh, let's run a cat all in the system before we tear it apart. That sounds funny, but that's exactly what we're going to do. That's it. 